Good. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for, for coming this evening uh, to uh, our, the Planning for Families with Special Needs Children seminar. Um, this is our third of our seminar series, at least for the spring. Well, we look forward to doing something similar uh, in the fall. Um, tonight's uh, focus is really um, planning for families, obviously, with that have special needs loved ones. And there is good in the sense that there is so much information out there now by virtue of being able to just do Google searches and there are so many groups out there that that people are part of and there's just a lot of information the challenge with that is there's so much information that you have to filter through because sometimes you just don't know what is accurate what is not accurate and one of the things that that i hear from time to time particularly when sitting with family members is you know people say that i know somebody that told me this and that's wonderful, but not all of the information is applicable the same way to every single person. It's not generally one size fits all. So the purpose of tonight is to help provide some basic information, some basic knowledge, and it will help maybe not answer all the questions, but help guide you to the right questions to ask and what's appropriate for your situation and certain things that you should know that that have different components in the way that things need to be addressed. So some of the things we're gonna talk about tonight are foundations and fundamentals that are going to build upon each other because they will impact on some of the main things that we will get to, such as uh, uh, the topic of special needs trusts. But you can't think about special needs trusts in a vacuum because there are a lot of different things that impact special needs trusts how they're funded, how they're administered, how they're dispersed in the future. So we need to get some of the basic foundational information before some of the other concepts make, a, make some sense. Um, Arla, uh, to my immediate left, is going to talk uh, about special education and IEPs and things of that sort. And we're going to try to hit some of the highlights and all of the things that touch the area of planning for special needs. So let me give everybody an introduction. To my far left is Jackie Yarmo. Uh, Jackie Yarma works with us in the, the elder law department. She does estate planning. She does uh, probate litigation. Um, and we're very happy to have her. She's She's been here for every time we do this, so about six months? Nine months. Nine months? Nine. Wow, it's been nine months. Almost. Okay. Um, and Shauna has been with us um, 11 years? No, no, no. Nine years? No. Four almost, months? Almost six years. Six here years. <laughs> I know everybody here extremely well. We spend a lot of time together. Maybe it feels like 11 years. <laughs> I think I've been here more. I've been here 13 years. Um, Shauna does primarily uh, probate litigation. So we do a lot of work. Um, but even within the realm of litigation, this, this stuff all touches one another. So there's some litigation that involves special needs. Um, and Shauna also does estate work and, and guardianships. Um, Arla, to my immediate left, uh, really is the um, central figure here on uh, special education, uh, IEPs, out of district placement issues, um, also guardianships and also uh, special needs. Arla also is on the, um, are you the president of the board? Yes. President of the board uh, of Employment Horizons and is very active in that organization. Arla has been here 94 years. Close. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was that right? right? Okay. <laughs> Uh, and to my right is, is Jason Marks. Jason Marks is uh, part of our trust and estates department. Um, Jason does uh, state planning. He also does elder law and um, does some high net worth planning and, and business succession planning. Anything else? Uh, tax planning, uh, smattering, of, you know, lots of different things. Okay. So that, that's, so that's that. And then I'm Richard Miller and I'm the chair of the elder law department. And I know I have been here 13 years. Um, all right, so we're going to get started in with some of the basics uh, because you need to we need to talk about estate planning um, as part of the foundation of special needs planning. So uh, uh, Shauna and Jackie are going to talk a little bit about some of the basic estate planning information everybody needs to know. Okay, thanks for coming, everyone. So like Richard said, um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about just basic estate planning essentials. Um, it may not seem to be directly related to special needs planning, but it really is. Um, in particular, a last will and testament. I'm sure that you know you guys are aware of what a will is. It's a document where you lay out your wishes for how you want your assets to pass after you die. 
Um, it also enables you to name an executor who will carry out your wishes and administer your estate after you pass. And um, you can also within it name a guardian for a minor child. So if your child with special needs is a minor, you can choose someone so that if you and your spouse or if you're a single parent, you know, you potentially, um, you know, someone will be appointed as their guardian after your death. Um, so in the will, obviously, you're going to lay out, you know, where you want your money to pass. And it's really important to um, do this carefully if you have a child with special needs, because as we'll get into later in the program, um, many people with special needs receive government benefits. And a goal of estate planning for a family that has a child with special needs is always um, how do we craft the estate plan so we can preserve that person's eligibility for government benefits yet still benefit them. And that's where a special needs trust will come into play. And we're gonna talk about that in much more detail. I think Richard's covering that later in the program. Um, but essentially it's something just to keep, keep in your mind right now that if you're doing a will and you have a child with special needs, um, it is a very good idea to incorporate a special needs trust into your estate plan um, because you want a vessel to hold money for your child's benefit, but done in a way so that it's not going to disqualify them from their government benefits. Um, so two other really important components of an estate plan that I'll talk about, and I'll also you know, link them to the special needs issue is a power of attorney and a living will. So a power of attorney is a document that is only operative during your lifetime. And in it, you designate an agent to make primarily financial decisions, some personal decisions for you during your lifetime. And it usually comes into play when um, you, know, you may become incapacitated for some reason. Perhaps someone has dementia and can no longer make their own decisions. Then their power of attorney, their agent under the power of attorney can then make financial decisions and take financial actions for them. And that can be very broad. It can include you know, handling bank accounts, selling real property, um, establishing trusts, having access to digital assets. That's a, that's a new one that we've added within the past few years to the power of attorney documents because so many of us keep our information digitally or in a cloud or something. So it's important for them to have access. Um, a power of attorney, as you can see here, can be durable or springing, meaning um, you can do a power of attorney that that is effective immediately and um, takes effect as soon as you sign it, or you can put a provision in that you want it to be springing, meaning that it springs into life um, if you are no longer competent and two doctors basically say that you are unable to make your own decisions. Um, so it's really up to you, you know, which one you pick. Um, and um, a power of attorney is also, also can be an important document for someone with special needs. Um, if you have a child with special needs or a loved one and they're able to understand the meaning and comprehend what a power of attorney is, um, it's something that you should explore having them sign um, because that can avoid, some, <laughs> avoid a guardianship, which we'll talk about in more detail later. Um, so it's important to consider that. A living will is a document wherein- Before you, you get to the living will, I just yeah. want a couple of comments on the power of attorney. Regardless if there's a special needs situation or not, any young adult should be encouraged to have a power of attorney. Um, and they also to an effect a living will, and maybe it's better if I wait till you have to do the living will, but the, the general theme is that if you have a young adult over the age of 18 going to college or even being home and they are hurt, they're disabled, they can't handle their affairs, they can't get into a bank account, um, it doesn't have to be a trigger because of a special needs. Everybody should consider having a power of attorney irrespective of age. It doesn't matter if someone is advanced age in their 90s, someone's 18, it, it doesn't matter. If you cannot handle your affairs, you need to appoint someone to do that because absent appointing an individual to handle your affairs, it may wind up in a court proceeding, which is expensive, it's intrusive, it's timely. So it's not just about ages or circumstances. It's kind of, this is something everybody should have. And the same thing for the living will. Right, and I can't tell you how many people I talk to who say, well, my child's 19, but they're my baby. Of course I can still make decisions for them if something happens. And it's like, well, no, you can't because now they're an adult. So that, that's an important comment. Um, so moving on to a living will, that is a document um, in which you can do a couple of things. You can lay out your end of life decisions, um, end of life wishes. So for instance, um, you know, do you wanna be kept alive artificially if you're unconscious and you have an irreversible and curable condition? Um, do you wanna donate your organs? Do you want certain religious beliefs to be honored in terms of your end of life decision-making? Um, do you have a preference to stay at home at the end of your life? 
So you can do that within that document. And you also can name an agent to make medical decisions for you and also get medical information about you. So if you for with HIPAA, you know, you can designate someone as your agent under that to get information about you. So, you know, obviously with these documents, it's important to appoint people that you trust, that you think are appropriate for the roles. Um, like I said before, with the living will, um, you know, if you have a child or loved one with special needs and they're able to understand and comprehend the living will and what it means and what it does, um, again, a really good idea to have one done and have them sign one because um, it could avoid potentially a guardianship later on. We'll talk more about what a guardianship is, but um, just to preface the topic, it is a, a, actually a court proceeding and, and there is cost associated with it potentially, it could be significant. So it's important to consider. And, and for us, I mean, when people come to us in crisis, I find it's often because um, these documents haven't been done, in particular, the power of attorney and the living will. Um, and this is important for anyone, even if, you know, they don't have a family member with special needs, but um, if something happens to you and you can no longer make decisions and there's no appointed decision maker, that opens up the door to a lot of conflict, confusion, um, potentially financial loss. So it's really important. I think these three documents are the basic building blocks of every estate plan. One thing that you also have to be aware with these three documents, all three of them are revocable. That's something they had to keep in mind because even though a document may be signed today, they can be ripped up tomorrow. And that has particular impact <clears throat> for all ages. But if you're one situation comes to mind uh, in particular, most challenging thing that I think I deal with situations where there's potential guardianships, powers of attorney and the like, and that is uh, usually mental illness and psychiatric issues. And that is kind of a, a category within the special needs arena because people come to us with a young adult that may be going through some serious mental health issues and they're not capable of taking care of themselves and they're in criminal trouble that they're in. They may have some substance abuse issues and, and they're really, quite frankly, a danger to themselves. And at some point, maybe they have done a power of attorney. At some point, maybe they have done a health proxy where they've named a parent or a loved one to be their agent. But the limitations of this document or the, all these documents is they can be ripped up tomorrow. So while somebody is functioning well and maybe they're on medications and maybe things are stable, these documents work well. But you have to think about what happens if there is some sort of hiccup and they're not going to allow these documents to remain in force. Something that, that in that arena is there, that's not on here is a psychiatric advance directive it is a document, it's a, it's a standard document. It's, it's actually, you can just Google it, New Jersey Psychiatric Advance Directive. That document has a little bit more teeth in it because it will survive and cannot be revoked if a doctor says that the person at that point is no longer able to make a reason. We'll also give instructions about certain treatment that the person wants or doesn't want. So in addition to these traditional documents, in certain cases where there are mental health issues, the psychiatric advance directive is something that is worth considering. But other than that, they're all revocable. Um, and that has to be weighed into the equation. Now there are gonna be borderline cases. Can someone sign the document, a legal document? Generally the standards are relatively low, that if the person understands the nature of the document and who they're appointing and why they're appointing that person, generally that, that is an acceptable standard for signing a document. Once again, if someone, the other point is, is that even if it's not revoked, the person can still override what the document says. So someone doesn't have to physically rip up the document to override it. They can just do what they want and the power of attorney doesn't have the right to restrict them. So if someone wants to be frivolous with a bank account and buy a car or, or be subject to scams or give money to a particular organization, power of attorney can't stop it. Power of attorney or a health proxy can only act as an agent for the person with the permission of that person, but it does not prevent the person from acting on his or her own. So that's, again, another limitation of these documents, which is going to segue into situations where you may need some more restrictive um, options down the road. 
Okay, probate and non-probate assets. You guys are going to talk about that as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an. Uh, before we go any further, though, I want you guys. I think Richard forgot to invite you to have some Panera food back there. If anybody's <laughs> hungry, and I know you just probably came from work. Please help yourself, mm -hmm. right, to sandwiches. And yeah, we don't mind if drinks you eat and a drink while we're talking. Please don't. We really don't care. Enjoy <laughs> them. Um, so probate and non-probate assets are. It's a really important distinction for folks to understand. Um, Probate assets are, are those that your will directs how they'll pass. And non-probate assets are those type of assets that are not encompassed under the will. So that, and you can actually switch to the next one because it'll give us some examples. Um, the main one that, that most folks think of as a non-probate asset is an insurance policy. You name someone on the insurance policy who is the beneficiary and the will has nothing to do with that person getting the proceeds of that insurance policy. So what we find is that people will put a lot of intentionality into their will and, and take a lot of care in determining who gets what or with percentages or whatever, but forget that they might've named back when they started this job, how many years ago and opened their life insurance, that there's a beneficiary on there that doesn't align with what really, how they want their, their, their assets to descend to their um, uh, heirs. So here's a few more. I don't have my glasses on so you can read the ones, but oh, like a payable on death account. So if you share an account with an elderly parent, um, there are certain types of accounts that will just directly pass and again, bypass the will. Um, property held in trust. And, and then of course, as well, if you share a deed um, to property, like real property. Um, yeah, and then, so those are some typical examples. And it's important again, when you are considering protecting um, a child or an a adult child's eligibility for certain government benefits. If you have them, everything tucked away into a trust and yet you forget that they're actually also gonna inherit a certain amount of money through a life insurance policy. You wanna be sure to actually include that in your conversation as you do your probate, as you do your estate planning to make sure that either you name the trust or you are careful with how those probate assets are titled. So I would say this is probably, if not the biggest mistake that I see people make in estate planning, it's probably certainly in the top three because people have a false sense of security that they've done their will, they've done their power of attorney, they've done their living will, they've done these trusts. But what they don't do is they don't go through the checklist of what passes through their will or passes through their estate and what passes by way of beneficiary. <laughs> If those two things do not are not consistent, the plan is going to fall apart. And this is extremely important when it comes to the special needs planning situation, but it also applies to other situations. Just take a situation where you have parents with minor children and the will says that leave everything in trust for the benefit of the minor children until they reach the age of 25 or 30 or whatever age, or it says it stays in trust for the life of the child and then passes to the grandchildren. Well, if that's what the will says, but the beneficiary designations don't leave it to the trust and it's gonna to go to the children. And if they're under age 18, it's gonna get stuck in some account until the child reaches age 18. Then when the child reaches age 18, they're probably too young and immature to actually get the money at that point. That's why you created the trust until age 25 or 30. That's one example. Another example could be because of marital issues. Maybe, Assets are not being left outright to a surviving spouse. Maybe it's a second marriage. Maybe it's a third marriage. Maybe the idea is that there is a trust in the will for the benefit of that spouse, where the spouse can use it for his or her life. And then the money in that trust upon the death of the survivor reverts back to children from a prior relationship. That's all great. The plan is fantastic. But if the house is in joint names or the accounts are in joint names between the spouses, Everything's going to pass to that surviving spouse outright, free of trust, no restrictions, and then that spouse can do whatever he or she wants with it. And then that risks what may ultimately go to the children from the first marriage. The issue with the special needs is exactly the same thing. We're going to have a special needs trust created for someone that's on government benefits. The will is going to make sure that the assets under the estate get directed into that special needs trust. However, if the beneficiary designations on the life insurance, on the retirement accounts, on the annuities, or whatever the case is, just simply generically names children, 
It doesn't matter that there is a special needs trust. It doesn't matter that there's a trust for a minor because those beneficiary designations are going to supersede anything that is directed under the will. So I cannot stress enough how critical it is to make sure that as part of any estate planning, you spend just as much time going through your assets and figuring out which ones have beneficiary designations, which ones have joint names, and make sure all of those things are connected in a cohesive plan. Anything you want to add to that? I right. think I would also just add that in addition, the reasons for also just being careful, not just to, to ensure that your wishes are effectuated, but to avoid conflict, because that's also a part of how we get a lot of our probate litigation is then there's conflict around actually what your intentions were, and then <clears> there <throat> creates, you know, conflict about where you didn't want it to be. In. Here's a practical concern <clears throat> that, that you know, people may experience. Everything seems to be done online now. Used to be that you got these documents, you filled out the documents, you were able to, to put in who your beneficiary is or your, your contingent beneficiary. Now it seems to be becoming more popular that, that, that you get this email and you have to fill out these beneficiary forms online. And they give you, you know, like this much space to fill in the beneficiary. And it makes it very challenging because they don't accept paper submissions anymore. And if there's not enough room to actually put the name of the trust or give you the right spacing to, to put the information, <clears throat> it may get rejected and people get frustrated and it doesn't make it very easy or inviting to be able to submit the appropriate beneficiary form. So it's something that you may have to just you know, work through, you may have to call HR, you may have to call whomever, to make sure that those beneficiary designations are confirmed what you think they are. Just to, just to add on to what Rich was saying, under the, the new Secure 2.0 Act, which came into existence at the end of 2022, if you're going to designate a trust as the beneficiary of a retirement account, it used to be that you could just designate the overarching name of the trust. Now, if you have sub-trusts that are created for each of your children, under the SECURE Act, you now have to designate each one of those subtrusts separately as a beneficiary of, of the retirement account. So it just makes the online completion of these beneficiary designation forms that much more complicated because a lot of employers, a lot of um, financial institutions that serve as trustees of these retirement accounts don't understand and haven't updated their internal systems to address this. Okay, so moving on. So if an individual is not capable of doing a power of attorney, if an individual is not capable of doing a health proxy, what are the other alternatives if they need some support? They need some supportive decision making. They need someone to be able to make decisions for them if they can't make their own financial, personal, legal, medical decisions, what options are, um, are out there. And there's no black and white. There's, these are all shades of gray. Um, so uh, Sean is gonna talk about different types of protective arrangements. Right, so um, I'm gonna talk about these different arrangements um, that you see on the screen. So there's three types we have here, guardianships, conservatorships, and protective arrangements. So um, a guardianship, a lot of you may have heard that term before. Um, basically, if you're seeking to be someone's guardian, you have to go to the court and say, Number one, I want to be appointed as this person's guardian. And number two, I should be appointed as their guardian because they're incapacitated, which basically means they're unfit and unable to manage their affairs. So I see this come into play a lot um, with families who have a child who is approaching adulthood very quickly. And, um, you know, they're often told by the school, you know, you should get a guardianship for your disabled child because of the nature of their disability. They are not able to make decisions on their own. Um, so that's often the time that this comes about. And um, this is the kind of guardianship you really can't necessarily avoid with a power of attorney or a living will if the child is, um, upon reaching adulthood, not able to understand those documents, not able to sign them. So um, with these, um, you know, these are what I consider sometimes they're the less contentious guardianships. Um, you know, oftentimes if a child's disability is severe enough, they're not really aware of what's happening. And if they are, sometimes they're aware of the fact that they need extra help. Um, but the fact of the matter is that a guardianship can potentially become contentious. So I'll talk a little bit about the process for a guardianship. Um, another reason to seek a guardianship would be that um, 
you know, maybe your child does have a power of attorney and maybe they do have a living will, maybe they have um, an advanced, you know, psychiatric directive done, but, you know, their actions and behaviors are reaching the level where they're maybe out of control and they're doing things that are harmful to themselves or to others. And you say, you know, these documents aren't really helping me anymore. I need to go to the court to get a guardianship because I really need more authority to, to take greater action um, to prevent harm from happening. So um, with a guardianship, it is actually a court proceeding. It's, it's basically a litigation. You have to file a complaint with the court saying exactly what I said before, you know, that this person needs a guardian and that you want to be appointed as their guardian. Um, in order to support that complaint, you need um, certifications from two doctors um, that state that the person is unfit and unable <clears throat> to manage their affairs. So as you can anticipate, sometimes that can be hard to get if, you know, the person that you're alleging is incapacitated, isn't cooperative. It can be difficult to get those exams done, which is not insurmountable, but that sometimes can be a challenge. Um, but um, if you can get those two doctor's exams, you submit those to the court with your complaint. Um, you also have to submit a certification of the person's assets. And um, they have been doing recently, I guess in the past couple of years, they're doing actually criminal background checks. I believe unless you're, um, I think it's unless you're a parent or a sibling, they're doing criminal background checks. So um, I think that shows you that the court takes this seriously. There was a movie um, that came out on Netflix a few years ago called I Care A Lot, which I think Richard couldn't even sit through the movie. I was yelling at the TV the whole time. <laughs> and it's about basically a professional guardian. Uh, I think it took place, um, I want to say, I think, it was in, I think it was in California or Nevada, Nevada. <laughs> um, somewhere out West. And, um, you know, people were just getting guardianships all over the place and doing all these terrible things. And uh, not to say that guardians are perfect and they don't do things that are, you know, inappropriate at times, but... In New Jersey, there are protections in place so that you can't just go into court and tell a judge, hey, they need a guardian. And then the judge says, OK. And then it's like rubber stamp without any support. So um, another component of the guardianship process is um, when you file the guardianship, the court will appoint an attorney for the alleged incapacitated person. So that attorney is another layer of protection because that person is going to meet with um, the person for whom the guardianship is sought. <laughs> with the person who's proposing to be the guardian. And they may also meet with other people um, who are related to the alleged incapacitated person, like people from their school or doctors or other family members or friends to get a sense of, you know, how do I advocate for this person? Do they want the guardianship? Do they not want it? Um, you know, is this person the appropriate guardian? And they actually have to render a report to the court of their findings and say, you know, yes, you know, I'm advocating for this person. They want a guardianship or no, they do not. Um, there are times when um, I, I've been a court appointed attorney many times and there are instances where, you know, I'll meet with someone and they don't want a guardian, but they really don't have the uh, the level of competence to really understand what that means. And um, sometimes I'll ask for something called a guardian ad litem to be appointed. And that's someone who um, doesn't represent the alleged incapacitated person but um, basically investigates the circumstances and tells the court, this is what's in the person's best interest. No, they don't want a guardian, but, but I think they should have one. So sometimes, you know, the applicant, the court appointed attorney and the guardian ad litem all work together as a team to try and accomplish a goal of trying to make sure that the person is protected. Um, so um, with a guardian, there's really two types. There's um, a guardianship of the person and a guardianship of the property. So person means personal decision-making, like where they live, um, you know, maybe like if they're going to a day program, things like that. And um, also guardian of the property and the estate, which is financial control. Um, sometimes people don't need a guardian of the property if they don't have any money and they just need a guardian of the person. Um, there are also times where the court will appoint a guardian on a limited basis. So for instance, they may say, um, yes, you can be appointed as guardian, but just to decide where this person lives and to manage a certain bank account. The courts want to give people for whom guardianships are sought as much autonomy as they possibly can. And there are times when that just isn't possible at all. Um, but there are times where they can carve out some, you know, things that some rights that they still have, some decision making power that they still have. And um, I think that's important to note because a lot of people are hesitant, especially for you know a child with a disability to say, well, I don't wanna take away all their decision-making, but they need help in this one area. So it's important to know that because you can actually ask the court, please just give me authority in this one area. And that sometimes can be very helpful. And guardians are also instructed to consider and, and seriously weigh the, the wishes of the person that is the, the, the incapacitated person. 
but that's really a, an important component that's articulated to all guardians. <clears throat> if I could just say one more thing. Yeah, of course, go ahead. I think it's important too in this context of folks that have a child aging into adulthood for whom they've always cared and how it seems like a lot of steps and a lot of procedures that it's a full you know, complaint before a judge, but it's important to keep that in context to the rights that are actually being taken away of the incapacitated person. So I think that while it may seem like overkill to a parent who's saying, I've been doing this for 18 years, and um, it, just in light of what the authority that is being granted that parent as this child ages into adulthood, that, that these protections are in place for the folks in Nevada too, who are just maybe have a little dementia and someone swoops in and becomes their guardian and swipes all their cash. So, you know, it's just, it's one big umbrella, but all the protections are in place for the same. Just to emphasize one of the things Jackie said is what people take for granted is they've been caring for a child for 18 years, but when that child turns age 18, technically they are emancipated. They can make their own decisions. And sometimes there's a false sense of security because even after the child turns age 18, um, maybe the doctors will speak to the parent. They're not supposed to because of the HIPAA rules. Perhaps other individuals will speak to the parent, but they're not supposed to with respect to legal decisions. So there's that false sense that everything will continue as it is, but you still want to be proactive. If there is a child who is about to turn age 18, and a guardianship is anticipated, you do not want to wait till the child is age 18 or 19 or 20 to start the process. You want to start the process approximately three, maybe four months before the 18th birthday because of the timetable it takes to get the papers filed in court, get doctor examinations, have the court appointed attorney do their assessment, and ultimately the perfect ideal would be to time the hearing before the judge right around the 18th birthday. So there is a seamless transition. So there is not a, a, a time period where the person does not have somebody to be, able, to be able to make decisions for him or herself. But I can't tell you how many times that we've seen people say, well, we don't need a guardianship. We didn't do a guardianship because everybody's still talking until the day that they don't, until the day that maybe there's a bigger medical issue and there's a hospitalization. Um, I think one of the cases we have right now is, um, they're so unfortunate, a, a young adult um, who is over age 18 with a rare form of cancer that needs experimental treatment. And I think he's in his early 20s. And up until this point, the mom has been able to speak with the doctors and the doctors have been able to speak with the mom, but now he needs admission to an experimental program and go to a hospital, not the one that she's used to dealing with. And they won't talk to her. <clears throat> He said, we cannot talk to you. He is over 18. He's not capable of making decisions. So now we're, we, you know, we got him appointed as temporary guardian for the, and we had to deal with the court and say, this is an emergency. They were like, okay, we'll set this down, you know, nine weeks or 12 weeks from now. No, no, no. He needs to get into an experimental treatment. This is an emergency. You need to appoint a temporary guardian. Point is, you don't want to be in that situation. You want to do these things and anticipate these things before they occur. So anybody that has a child that you may think a guardian is needed for, you want to do it three or four months before the 18th birthday. Right. I recently was court appointed as attorney for um, someone. He was in his early 30s and he had been disabled since he was about 11 or 12 years old. And um, his mother just never got a guardianship. And um, the reason she decided to do it now was um, he was hospitalized. And for the first time, no one would give her any information. She said she had a really frightening night in the hospital. And finally, you know, they relented and said, okay, you're his mother, you know, we're going to give you information. But she was like, I never want that to happen again, because periodically he does have episodes. He goes to the hospital. <laughs> I don't ever want to be in that position again. So it well, was it's not all of it's not always medical. Sometimes, again, sometimes it's more some of the mental illness, psychiatric behavioral issues where there is police involvement. People are driving, they get pulled over, they act inappropriately, it puts them in danger. Sometimes having the guardianship and notifying a local police department that there is a guardianship will be proactive and preventative of, of events that can be really kind of tragic. So it's about getting that authority, making sure it's communicated to everybody. Um, I know we need to move forward because we, we could spend you know half, half a day on guardianships. The one thing that I think we should just touch on is the D, a DDD guardianship because the rules have changed over the last number of years to actually make it a little bit easier for those registered uh, with DDD and getting a guardianship. 
Does anybody want to talk about that? Right. So, um, well, I know one of the things that's easier with that is um, if you're registered for DDD, you can submit um, in support of your application, you can submit a doctor's exam and an IEP, your individualized education program. So, you, you know, that saves you the cost potentially of having to do a second doctor exam and you could just get the IEP from the school. So that makes things a bit easier for you. Yeah, and the, it normally with a traditional guardianship, doctor exam has to be within 30 days of filing a complaint. With DDD, it could be six months of filing a complaint. The IEP needs to be within two years. Also with a DDD guardianship, with the court appointed attorney, you can request that the public defender's office be assigned, which will be free of any cost. Some counties say it's too much of a backlog for the public defender's office, so they will assign an attorney pro bono. But that's generally only in a DDD guardianship. So it's a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more cost effective. Uh, but technically, with a DDD guardianship, you can only be guardian of the person. You can't be guardian of the property. So if there are any assets, that's, that uh, kind of uh, prevents that option. But something to um, actually was a very good change. It just makes it a lot more user friendly. And one thing I want to quickly touch upon before we move on to a different topic is um, if you are appointed as guardian, you have annual reporting requirements to the court. So the court doesn't just say, hey, you're guardian, go do whatever you want. Um, and that may comprise um, some financial reporting, depending on what the financial circumstances are. Certainly, if the person is receiving Social Security benefits, you would need to submit an annual report of that. And also an annual report of well-being, saying, you know, this person still needs the guardianship because of this. Um, here's some developments in their condition, um, just so the court is staying on top of it. And they haven't moved, let this address, that kind of thing. And guardians actually, uh, guardianships can actually be reversed. Just because someone has been adjudicated in doesn't mean there cannot be a reverse adjudication that they are no longer incapacitated. Seen it a couple of times. So it's actually very nice. It's a, it's a, it's a nice proceeding. Um, so nothing's permanent. Things can be reversed. What may be right now may not be right in the future. All right. So with that, we're going to change topics. I'm going to turn it over to Arla to talk a little bit about special education issues. <clears throat> and I just want to advance the slide, I think, to... One more, great, wonderful. Um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or otherwise known as the IDEA is a federal educational civil rights statute. And New Jersey has adopted the IDEA as uh, part of its administrative code and its statutes that pertain to school law. And what um, special education really is, is specialized education where the curriculum is actually modified to benefit the student who has a disability. Um, it is for a public school student and it, it only applies to public school students. So for that student, it's free of charge to the family and can involve a lot of different types of program uh, modifications to, and it's individualized to that particular student's disability and their needs. Next slide. Um, so, a lot of clients come to me and they're surprised to learn that special education is um, available to students who are age three through 21. Uh, most of us think that um, a student who turns age 18 or 19 is must be graduated. Not necessarily the case. Depending on the severity of the disability, the student can continue um, to receive special education until the student is 21 years old. And that 21 year period is through the end or conclusion of the school year in June. Um, there's a requirement under the federal and state law for child find and the child find mandate uh, requires a public school district to be on the lookout for students who may have areas of suspected disability and schools are required to identify, locate, and evaluate students who may have potential educational disabilities and um, evaluate those students. Students can also be referred to the school district for evaluation by a parent or doctors um, who are pediatricians who are um, otherwise providing care for those students. Um, with respect to the evaluations, all areas of the suspected disability must be evaluated. Um, so what will happen is <coughs> parent and an IEP team will be, or child study team will sit, sit down and have a meeting that specifically discusses the um, areas of suspected disability. And there will be a determination of what types of evaluation should take place, whether it be a psychological, 
occupational therapy evaluation, speech language pathologist evaluation, or such other evaluation that might um, assist the team in understanding what the nature of the disability is and the scope of that disability. Um, just advance one more. Um, in New Jersey and under the IDA, is um, uh, there are a list of um, 14 eligible character, uh, pardon me, categories of disability. And the most frequently seen um, areas of disability can, would be the autistic spectrum, um, specific learning disability, preschool child with a disability, um, and emotionally disturbed. Um, I often see other health impaired or multiply disabled. Those are the primary um, more frequent eligibility categories under which students are classified as eligible for special education services. Um, the IEP or the Individualized Education Program is the document that houses or contains the information about the nature of the student's disability. It talks about um, what interventions and supports the student needs, in what way the student's educational program needs to be modified from the general uh, regular education curriculum and any other supports we are called related services. So students may have a need for occupational therapy. They may have a need for speech language therapy services, um, counseling, um, assistive technology, transportation to school. So specialized transportation may be necessary to enable a child to benefit from their educational program um, and also extended school year, which is an additional, typically additional four to six weeks extension of the regular school year to provide additional services to the student um, to prevent regression of um, skills and loss of knowledge over the summer vacation. Um, there's a concept called least restrictive environment. So as part of that analysis of what's appropriate for the student, parents and the IEP team are going to look at where can the student be accommodated in the least restrictive environment. So the least restrictive environment is a continuum. The, the um, continuum starts with the regular education program and the school district and the parents will look at whether or not the student can be educated in the regular education program that the student would have otherwise attended but for the disability. And if the student can be provided with supports in that environment, that's the least restrictive environment appropriate for that particular student. Students with more um, dis severe disabling conditions may need a more restrictive environment. And on the slide, you'll see there's a, um, a colorful uh, depiction of of what constitutes least restrictive to the most restrictive. So you're gonna look at um, the most restrictive as being a residential placement where the student is so severely disabled. This often um, occurs when a student is suffering from a severe mental disability, a health issue. Um, Self-contained classes, um, typically for students who have a more severe, um, uh, they're more severely autistic will be many times in a self-contained classroom or will spend you know, 30% of their time in the regular education environment with non-disabled peers, but then might be pulled out for another portion of the day um, in a self-contained class where all students in that class have IEPs and are um, educationally disabled. And that's that. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the special needs trusts, and that is kind of a, an umbrella term that is generic, but it's not very um, it's not very specific and it doesn't really, and it really creates a lot of confusion. So special needs uh, trusts generally are intended to refer to a trust that money can go into and the money in that trust will not interfere um, or disqualify the beneficiary from government benefits. The money can be used at the discretion of the trustee for the benefit of the beneficiary in a way that will allow that money to be available, but not disqualify the individual from government benefits such as uh, SSI or Medicaid. And that's critical <clears throat> because someone on SSI and Medicaid, you do not want that person to accidentally receive funds um, and then um, basically prevent them from receiving the benefits that they're entitled to. Now, there are two types of special needs trusts, and this is an important distinction. 
There is a self-settled special needs trust, and then something I call a third-party supplemental benefits trust. Self-settled, third-party. The difference is who funded the trust? Where did the money come from? If the money comes from the individual who is receiving government benefits, it's that person's money funding the trust, it is self-settled. Person receiving the benefits is the one funding the trust. They are, they are creating the trust for their own benefit. And when I say they, it could be a guardian, it could be a parent, it could be a power of attorney, but the money originates from the person who is receiving the benefit from the trust. As opposed to a third party trust, a third party trust is funded with assets that belong to somebody other than the disabled individual on government benefits. Usually that's a parent or a grandparent or someone else. Now, why is this important? What's the difference between the two? Because they basically do the exact same thing. The difference between the two is that a self-settled trust has two major setbacks or two major negatives. One is that there is a lot of accounting that needs to be done to the state of New Jersey. And the reason there is accountability to the state of New Jersey is because of reason number two, which is the negative. And that's because anything left over in that trust after the death of the beneficiary needs to be used to repay the state of New Jersey for any Medicaid benefits properly expended. <clears throat> so anything left goes back to New Jersey to repay them dollar for dollar what they have expended in benefits. So it, anything left over after repaying New Jersey can then go to whomever you decide as, as the beneficiary, but New Jersey gets paid back first. So why is there accountability? Because New Jersey is saying, wait a second, I don't want you spending things out of this trust that are not appropriate because every dollar you spend is less we're gonna collect at the end. So there are certain restrictions. Any distribution of more than $5,000 needs the permission of the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services. Annual accountings need to be given and itemized as to what was spent because it must be for the exclusive benefit of that beneficiary. Whereas a third party trust, if it's created by a third party, the biggest benefit is there is no payback provision to the, to the state of New Jersey. So it can be left to whomever you want. And because it can be left to whomever you want without a payback provision, there is not that level of oversight that New Jersey cares about because they're not getting it anyway. So you don't need to ask their permission for a $5,000 disbursement. You don't need to give them monthly statements at the end of the year as to how the funds were dispersed. So the, the real critical thing here is to make sure that in estate planning, and that's the reason we went through the foundational stuff, is that you got to make sure that the assets as part of an estate plan, someone on government benefits, gets into the right trust. So from an estate planning point of view, if there is a parent with a special needs child on government benefits, you want the third party supplemental <clears throat> needs trust without the payback provision. I have seen out there trusts that are created by a parent with the parent's money or someone else's money with payback provisions in them. That is 100% wrong. There is no need for that. You're giving money away. You wanna make sure A, it's the right trust, and two, for the reasons that Shauna and Jackie pointed out, you got to make sure that if there are <coughs> beneficiary designations, they then go into that third party trust and not accidentally to the beneficiary him or herself. Because if someone accidentally leaves money to someone on government benefits, that's bad. The saving grace is, is that a self-settled special needs trust can then be created by that person provided they are under age 65 or 64. And then it will go into the trust, allow that person to remain on government benefits, but now you've just created the payback provision. So it's something that's totally avoidable. Usually, sometimes it's not avoidable. You may have someone that's, that's fine. They get into an unexpected accident. They now have a disability. They need government benefits. They have assets in their name. And those assets are putting them over a $2,000 resource limit. So they have to now solve the problem. The problem is solved by taking the assets and putting them into a self-settled trust. Or there's a lawsuit. Sometimes that is a, is a situation where there's maybe a birth injury. There's a, there's a situation where then a lawsuit is started. Money is recovered for the benefit of that, the baby or the minor. That money is technically in the name of the minor. 
in order to get that child government benefits, it's got to go into the self-settled trust, and that comes with the payback provision. So there is a huge distinction between these two things. It is critical to make sure you have the right trust and that that right trust is funded through the proper beneficiary designations. So that's the, the distinction between that. Um, for those of you who are here, um, the folders we have out front have a special needs handbook. Anybody online, we can send that. We can send the special needs handbook. Um, it gives you the distinction between first party trust and third party trust. It also discusses a lot of the things we've talked about today. The other thing that I find very helpful is people come with us to us with questions about how to administer these trusts, whether it's a first party trust or a third party trust. What are we allowed to, to spend on? What can't we spend on? Will it affect SSI benefits? There are a lot of questions and they're very detailed and very fact specific of what can this money be used for? Something that I find very helpful, it's online, it's free. I encourage you to print it out if you have a special needs trust. It's called Administering a Special Needs Trust, a handbook for trustees. There's a new one that comes out every year. This is the 2023 edition. And it is put out by somebody called the organization is the Special Needs Alliance. All you have to do is go to Google, type in administering a special needs trust, special needs alliance. It will come right up. You can print it out, download it. It's entirely free and it will go through all of the things that I've just discussed. The distinguishing <laughs> factors between the two trusts, what you can pay, what you shouldn't pay. So I encourage people to get that if they if they have a trust that they are administering. Um, people then ask about, okay, well, we know about a special needs trust, we know about a supplemental needs trust, but what is an ABLE account? Is that the same, is it different? How do those things relate to one another? So Sean is gonna talk about ABLE accounts. So um, an ABLE account is not a trust, it is an account. So the name of it is, uh, is not a, you know, a misnomer, it's, it's actually an account. And I compare it sort of to a 529 account where you save for educational expenses. It's, it's similar to that. It's a tax advantage savings account. Jason's going to talk more about the tax implications of them, so I'm not going to get too much into that. But um, an ABLE account, I think, is a really nice option in particular um, in this scenario. So um, perhaps you have a child who has a disability, but they're working, um, you know, and you would like them to have some autonomy over their money and, you know want them to be able to save some money that maybe can be used for some things that will help them. So I always think that's a really great use for an ABLE account in that scenario. Um, now, it's an account, but there are limitations on what you can put in it and what you can do with the money in it. Um, so with an ABLE account, the person that benefits has to have um, the onset of their disability has to be before they're 26 years old, but you can open it at any time. So if you have a 28 year old, but the onset of their disability was when they were, you know, born, then you can still open an ABLE account for them or they can open it. Um, there's a total annual contribution of $17,000 and that changes annually. I think before it was 15,000, before that was 13,000. It goes up a little bit um, every year usually. And um, in addition to that, if the ABLE account um, owner is employed, they can make an additional contribution amount up to the federal poverty level for a one person household. So in 2023, that's about $13,590, which you know is not a ton of money, but it is a significantly greater amount than you could contribute um, if you, you know, were limited with the 17,000. So um, you may be thinking, so, okay, if you have an ABLE account and you're getting SSI benefits from social security, how does it impact that? So the first $100,000 in an ABLE account is exempt from Social Security's resource limit, which is only $2,000. Um, so if you were to put in more than $100,000 into the ABLE account, you can't get your SSI payments anymore. They figure you have too much money to be getting those, but you can still get Medicaid if that's part of your benefit package, as long as you're otherwise eligible. Um, in New Jersey, the total cap for an ABLE account is $305,000 for this year. Um, and the money in it can be invested. So you can have like an investment portfolio to, to grow with the account. Um, it can be used as a checking account with a debit card. And the 
important thing is to know that if you're going to take money out of the ABLE account, it can be used only for a qualified disability expense. Those can include um, transportation, assistive technology, education, um, support services. I think of the classic scenario that um, someone has an ABLE account and they're working and they need transportation to get to their job so they can work. So maybe they need someone to take them to work or they need a car to get to work. Um, that would be something they could use the account for. Um, if you don't use the account for the qualified disability expenses, there actually is a penalty for that. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, the ABLE accounts are state by state. The states have um, some differences in how they're managed and what you can put in them. So it's important to do it. If you're in New Jersey, you have to establish the ABLE account in New Jersey. And just like the um, type of special needs trust that Richard was talking about, they do have a payback provision. So that's a drawback, but... Yeah, well, I don't see a lot of ABLE accounts it, it, because it is the same as a self-settled trust. You still have the payback provisions. You still, still have accountings to the state of New Jersey. The real purpose of an ABLE account is autonomy and self-determination. With a special needs trust, the person could, well, up until fairly recently, could not establish it, and they could not be the trustee of their own trust. So you may have a trustee that is capable of administering their finances and they want to be participating in the management of their finances. That cannot happen with a special needs trust. But an ABLE account was specifically created for someone that can manage their finances, wants that autonomy, still on <clears> government <throat> benefits, so they can do it. The ABLE account does allow that beneficiary to manage the account him or herself. And I think it encourages them, you know, to, to work and be productive and to be able to reap some of the benefits of that and not just see it go into a trust they have zero control over. So, But it also depends upon the amount that's going in. So right. if you've got funds, that, if you got amounts that are being funded because of a, a settlement lawsuit, typically that amount is going to be greater than the, the threshold for an ABLE account. So the only course you have then is a first party special needs trust. One of the things that I think it's very useful for is that when someone is receiving SSI benefits, that individual cannot have more than $2,000. <clears> and so what parents are forced to do is if there is really no need to spend that money every month and that account is going to now creep up to $2,000 and beyond, parents feel the need to now spend that money down. And they may not want to spend it on certain things. There's no need for it. They just feel the need because it's got to get below $2,000. One of the, the, the features of an ABLE account where I think it works well is if someone is going to start accumulating those SSI benefits and now all of a sudden the account's gonna start creeping over the $2,000 rather than forcibly spending it on something maybe you wouldn't otherwise choose, an ABLE account can be created. The excess now that's coming in from SSI that would otherwise put the account over $2,000 can now go into the ABLE account now the ABLE account can accumulate and accumulate more than $2,000. So there's a pool there for the benefit of that, uh, that child moving forward without feeling you have to forcibly spend it every month to get below the threshold. So the ABLE account is a nice receptacle for that stuff. All right, anything, um, no, we're gonna talk taxes. So anything you wanna talk about taxes on special needs trust or ABLE accounts? Okay, well, fun topic, taxes. Um, Trusts come in two different flavors uh, as far as income taxation is concerned. There are grantor trusts and there are non-grantor trusts. Let's talk about what they are in general first and then I'll, I'll, I'll attach the, the, the label to the particular type of special needs trust that we're talking about. So a grantor trust is a trust in which the person who has created and funded the trust um, is treated for income tax purposes as being the owner of the assets of the trust rather than the trust being deemed as the owner of the assets. The result of that, and I, I refer to this as an income tax fallacy, <coughs> the assets are actually owned by the trust, but for income tax purposes, the deemed ownership is, is the individual who created and funded the trust. So in other words, the income now passes through to the grantor of the trust and the grantor will report that income on his or her individual income tax return on the 1040, okay? A non-grantor trust is any trust that is not, is just the opposite. A non-grantor trust is a trust where the trust itself is its own tax paying entity, okay? And every year the trust will file a more in-depth fiduciary income tax return called a form 1041 
and it will report its own income. It will also pay the tax on the income to the extent that the income has not been distributed out to the beneficiary or for the benefit beneficiary's benefit. So if, the, if there's a distribution of income from the trust to the beneficiary of a non-grantor trust, the beneficiary will report the income on his or her own individual income tax return, and the trust gets a deduction for that distribution. All right, the, the grantor trust, it doesn't matter if distributions have been made out of the trust to the beneficiary, the grantor will still recognize the income on their own income tax return. And either way, a certain, in that case, a simple 1041 with what's called a pass-through letter will be filed on behalf of the trust. Um, each trust will get its own tax ID, ID number, okay? Uh, the, let, let's, let's associate it with the particular trust that we've been talking about. The first party special needs trust, okay? This is a trust that is a grantor trust. It is a grantor trust because the beneficiary himself, the disabled individual, has funded the trust with his or her own assets and has reserved or has the ability to have paid out to him or her the income from the trust, okay? So it is a grantor trust and that individual will report the income on his or her own income tax return. The third party special needs trusts can be either grantor or non-grantor and depending upon how the trust is designed, can toggle the income taxation, the grantor status of it on or off. Typically, when I draft trusts, I start as a not as a non grant as excuse me as a grantor trust. I'd rather have the person, the third party creator of this trust, be responsible for paying the tax. Okay, if there happens to be a lot of income that's derived, we can always arrange for a reimbursement provision, but. I always like to have it set up so that the trust, the grantor pays the tax because it's essentially another gift into the trust without triggering any gift tax issues. Um, that segues me into the other side of things of gift and estate tax. Grantor trusts and non-grantor trusts, the, the first party special needs trust, because it's self-settled <coughs> in New Jersey, creditors, can get to potentially the assets in a self-settled trust. Therefore, it's includable in the individual's estate for estate tax purposes, okay? The transfer into the trust itself is not a gift because the individual has not completely cut off all dominion and control or, or rights to have access to those assets. So it's an incomplete gift into the trust. There are no gift tax consequences which means that when the individual dies, they get a step up in basis as the assets pass on to the next next generation or whoever the remainder beneficiaries are after the payback has taken place, okay? With respect to the third party trusts, those also can be set up as either completed gift trusts so that any assets that go into the trust, I create a trust for the benefit of my son who is, has disabilities, it's set up as a supplemental benefits trust, but I have given up all control and access to the assets in that trust. I don't have any rights to change the beneficial enjoyment at any time, even at my death. So it is out of my estate. I've made a completed gift. I have to, I have to file a gift tax return. I'm allowed an annual exclusion amount of up to $17,000 for each person who receives the, the benefits of that trust. And beyond that, the, there's no step up basis. If, however, I decide to create a non-grantor incomplete gift trust, uh, or say, or a grantor incomplete gift trust, where I am now reserving some power to control the beneficial enjoyment of the assets in that trust at my death or any time in between, then the assets will be included in my estate. I don't have to file a gift tax return because I'm not completed the gift. It will be included in my estate. I get the step up in basis and the assets passed to my son as beneficiary of that trust for his benefit. Um, that pretty much covers the income taxation and all the other tax consequences of these trusts. All right, we're going to um, wrap up in a couple of minutes. So before we do, any uh, commercials for Employment Horizons? Sure. Um, so we like to educate the public on. Um, 
resources out there for individuals with disabilities. Um, there's an organization in New Jersey called Employment Horizons. It's a nonprofit organization that's been around since the 1950s, and it's located in Cedar Knolls, New Jersey. And what they do is a comprehensive approach to providing employment um, related services. So evaluation, uh, vocational evaluations, pre-employment training, um, training uh, with respect to skills and, and job skill development, and um, also supported employment where um, a specialized individual will shadow um, uh, an employee and then gently fade out as that employee gains skills and confidence in their employment situation. Um, a recent program that was devised or developed by um, Employment Horizons is called, called the RISE program, and it stands for Readiness for Individual Success and Employment. And it's very complementary to public schools' obligations to provide transition planning services starting at age 16 um, to enable students um, who receive special education services to develop the necessary skills to um, have independence and autonomy as an adult, whether that be job training, uh, college, um, vocational um, college aspirations, and other vocational type um, skills. Um, and what's great about the RISE program is that while the school district's obligation for transition planning services concludes at age 21, this actually goes um, beyond that to um, cover up to age 24, which is often the gap period where students who had a very high level of support as a public school student graduate, leave their um, program at age 21, and then um, do not have really anything that intensive to support them. So this is uh, a great program to um, capture that gap period um, to provide additional skills and access to employment. So the last thing I just want to mention before we wrap up is, is this is another common mistake people make is they, there's that there is SSD and SSI. And people often conflate or confuse those two topics. One more. Mm -hmm. um, SSI is a is a needs-based program where an individual cannot have assets more than two thousand dollars. If someone has SSI, they will get Medicaid automatically. In order to be eligible for DDD, the person needs to be Medicaid eligible. So SSI is critical. That is completely needs-based and asset-based. SSDI, Social Security Disability, does not look at one's resources or assets. You could have hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. If you've paid into the Social Security system, you subsequently become disabled, you can receive and you're entitled to Social Security Disability. If you are on Social Security Disability for two years, you automatically get Medicare, not Medicaid. Medicaid is, is going to be the needs-based program. Medicare is going to be kind of like uh, what you're in 65 and retire, same Medicare program. So people often confuse these things because when we, when we see new clients, they simply say, well, yeah, the, um, my child is on Social Security. Okay, well, is it Social Security Disability or is it SSI? Because if they're on Social Security Disability, then the Supplemental Needs Trust, the Special Needs Trust, are not as critical because there is no resource limit that you need to fall below. You may want to trust for other reasons, but you don't need it to, to qualify for Medicaid. If they're on SSI, becomes way more critical. You've got to look at the beneficiary designations. You've got to make sure that the will leaves everything to a third-party supplemental needs trust because any money accidentally going to that child is going to disqualify him or her from that government benefit. And then with, with it goes Medicaid, with it goes DDD and all the other resources. So just want to make sure that you understand the distinction between those two terms. Um, with that, we are just about at our point, a little over an hour. We appreciate you coming and listening. And for those on Zoom, we appreciate you joining us. And um, hope everybody has a nice evening. Questions? Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks.